Stop whatever you're doing and listen to Josh and Daniel, Diary of the Madman, the ultimate Aussie podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Diary of the Mad Men, the ultimate Aussie Osborne podcast, where we discuss all things Aussie and Aussie related. I am Josh Crum, and as always with us is Mr. Dan Drago. How's it going, Dan? Hey, Josh. How are we doing today, man? Doing good, man. Got to do what we have to to make this show work. I had a birthday party last night for my daughter. I have twins. We have their party separate. The boys' party was Friday. And I have like seven or eight girls in my house going wild. So I'm currently sitting inside my vehicle. With headphones on, trying to make this show happen for our listeners. How about you? <laughs> yeah, doing well, man. I we appreciate you doing what you have to do to get this out there for our listeners. Doing good, man. Just you know, same shit. Coaching away out here. Been doing a lot of football tournaments and stuff. And you know, I'm really excited about our guest today. Absolutely. So on today's show, we have Mr. Alan Barry, who you may not be familiar with by name, but Alan has recently released a documentary on Black Sabbath sabotage record, and it's for free view on YouTube. And it's done really well, man. Like, he's only had it out for, as we record this, like, two weeks and already has almost a half million views. It's fucking crazy. It's really good. What did you think? What an amazing documentary and a great guy, too. I really enjoyed our conversation. And I got to be honest, I was just so stoked that he picked Sabotage. We don't see a lot on that era, so I was really pumped when that came out. Absolutely. Both of us, it's our favorite Black Sabbath record. So I was totally stoked that they chose Sabotage and uh, they done an excellent job, man. We'll definitely let listeners listen to that before we tell you all about it. But in the meantime, nothing new still on the Aussie front. You know, we're all patiently waiting for the new Aussie record. It's starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. Like when we're going to get this damn thing. I know we've had some listeners reach out to us and ask us if we've heard anything and trust us. If we hear anything on the new Aussie album, you will be the first to know. We'll let you guys know on our socials immediately. So far, no no word, man. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of it is just due to manufacturing issues. You know, we just saw that the Megadeth album got pushed back. I imagine Ozzy's record going to be pushed back. I know it said Sony came out and said that it's going to be out through April, but I think we would have had a single by then. So if something doesn't come soon, I, I foresee this album getting pushed back some. Yeah, you know, Ozzy probably. was just on Ozzy Speaks last week, and he really didn't say much, just that it's slow but steady and a work in progress. I don't know what that means, but that's the last update we got. Yeah, totally. I mean, at this point, it seems like summer at best, because like you said, they're going to do a minimum of two months late on a single, if not three. Under the Graveyard was almost four months before the album came out, so they're definitely going to want a lot of lead time on the singles. Hard to imagine now we get it before April, and that's totally disappointing, but at the end of the day, we do want it to be done right. You know, One argument is, well, you live in a digital world anyway now. Why are you waiting on physical product? Classic artists such as Ozzy Osbourne, they do rely heavily on the physical sales. I mean, me and you, speaking for the two of us, we bought two or three copies of Ordinary Man upon this release. You know, you had the CD version, the digital version, which I do stream that. Of course, the the vinyl deluxe and all that. You know, this is Ozzy Osbourne. They want it to be done upright and proper. So I, I could see them waiting on the vinyl. You know, they want to be more professional than the album has been released April 14th. You'll receive your vinyl on June the 17th. I just don't think that's the route they're going to want to go with that. And, you know, let's just be real. They're wanting to make that push for that number one album. It's still out there. Ozzy achieved it with Black Sabbath. But his goal has always been to have a Billboard number one in the United States. And they've been so close so many times. And they're going to want that physical product to back that up. Good point on, the, on buying multiple copies. I think I have three vinyl versions of Ordinary Man alone. I think that's spot on that they're going to wait for everything to be done so they can just roll it out. And I think they'll have two singles. Wasn't Straight to Hell even released before the record came out? Yeah, they had uh, had three, actually. Three, right? Ordinary and, Man, too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they're going to want to release a few singles, but I don't think they set an actual release date until they know when the vinyl product can be in hand. On the other front, and this is awesome, and we knew this for sure, but we did make a mistake last episode, and, and we want to thank Chris Stewart for bringing it to our attention on the last episode, the Ultimate Sin episode. We had said that never was never played live before, but come to find out it was played live two or three times on the Sweden tour back in 1986. And, you know, we actually even have the bootleg and we have a version of it. So <laughs> that, you know, just things <laughs> do slip through the cracks. Hey, thank you for Chris for, for keeping us on our toes. That's exactly what we expect our listeners to do. And, you know, like we've talked about shit does fall through the cracks. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're not perfect. We don't claim to know everything. We just claim to know a lot. And then after he pointed that out to us that he did play on that tour, we went back and actually listened to the bootleg, and it's pretty ripping. They should have kept it on the tour, man. I thought it sounded great. Yeah, so we definitely appreciate him pointing that out, A, to correct us, but two, so we can go back and check it out again. Speaking of that, I'm glad you brought that up. The feedback on The Ultimate Sin was through the roof, man. This this episode really took off. Like, What did you think about the uh, feedback on it? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think it's our most popular episode yet. There's just something about the Jake era that it's endearing to a lot of our fans and to us in particular. So I'm super excited to see that one blow up. I'm real, real happy with the feedback. And what yeah. love, love our fans have for that record. I know, man. It's funny. It's to be an album that many consider the worst of Ozzy's solo career, and it's so often referred to as that. But yet there's so much passion for it also. It's so strange. But, you know, I totally get it because you and I have a passion for it also. That's why we cover it. But, yeah, I thought that episode did really good. The numbers on it have been really good, and we couldn't be happier with it. So we thank you guys for listening. Don't forget to also subscribe and leave us comments, rate our show and all that fun stuff also on whatever you listen to us on via Apple or Spotify or whatever. One thing I want to mention, too, we recently added the podcast to Facebook. So if you are a Facebook person, this is apparently a new feature on Facebook, but you can subscribe straight through Facebook and you'll get notifications on when we have new episodes and they download straight to your Facebook somehow. So that's pretty cool, too. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for setting it up. And I just want to last yeah. thing I want to say about The Ultimate Sin for sure is now that it had slipped our mind that never was played live. Can you believe seven of the nine songs were played live on that tour? That's pretty remarkable. Seven of nine. That's fucking crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Like at some point you should go ahead and play all nine of them. Oh, yeah, right. Fuck it. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah, for sure. And the only two that weren't were Fool Like You and Lightning Strikes. So kind of crazy that seven of the nine songs were played on that tour. Hats off yeah. to that band. And Fool Like You, like we discussed in the show, how good that song is. So for that to be one of the ones that's left off. And, and Lightning, Lightning Strikes, Strikes was a yeah. singer. So yeah. it's just so strange that, that those are the two. It was a fun episode. I do love talking about the Jakey e. Lee stuff. You know, one thing that you and I discussed before we ever even began the podcast is we wanted to talk about the things that no one else talks about. And I think we're really achieving that. Shows like The Ultimate Sin, we've, we've done a deep dive on The Ultimate Sin and Osmosis now before we have Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman. I think that says a lot about what we're trying to do with this show. And I think fans are really appreciating that. And we thank you guys for the support with that. We really do. Yeah, no question. And please keep continuing giving us some feedback. And again, let us know what some shows you want to hear. We're super excited to be talking to Alan today. And I think you guys are going to really enjoy our conversation. Yeah, Alan, he is on par with me and Dan. He knows a whole lot about Black Sabbath. So you guys are going to definitely enjoy this, this conversation. He drops a lot of nuggets also. Hell, let's get to it. This is Alan Barry from Black Sabbath Sabotage, the documentary. Hello, today we're excited to welcome to the show Mr. Alan Barry. Alan has recently released the Black Sabbath Sabotage documentary that has been making a splash on the internet all over the place. Alan was the editor, writer, voice, and producer of the show, so almost a one-man project, but we're excited to have him on today. How's it going, Alan? Hey, real good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, absolutely. So the show, man, Black Sabbath Sabotage, the documentary, it's done well. Are you surprised by the success so far? So, I mean, yes and no. So I had a video before that, which was um, about Frank Zappa's love for Black Sabbath, and it did really well. I think it had around like 260,000 views, et cetera. Now that surprised me. I was really surprised by that. So coming into this video, I was hoping that it would at least match it, right, as far as views go. And this time around, before I actually released it, I had a small group of Sabbath fans and friends of my own that I kind of passed around to see what the vibe was on it. And I got good responses from everybody. So when I released it, I was pretty sure it was good. I was hoping that it would do as well as the Zappa Sabbath video, but I guess I have been kind of surprised how quickly it's nearing 400,000 views. Yeah, it has really taken off and congratulations. It's an amazing documentary and I'm going to definitely urge our listeners to find it. I mean, you guys are listening to us because we're Aussie heads and Aussie historians. Let me tell you, Alan has done an amazing job with this documentary. And of course, we're going to get into why Sabotage, which is very dear to my heart and Josh's, which is my favorite Sabbath record. So definitely hats off, Alan. You did a fantastic job on it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, man. I don't make any money from doing this, right? So when I hear other Sabbath or Ozzy fans that they enjoyed it, it probably sounds corny, but it really means a lot. And it encourages me to make more because at the end of the day, this is a different type of family that I have, the Sabbath and Ozzy family. So to hear right. another family member say that they really dug it or that they liked watching it, it just means a lot. So thank you for the compliments. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. We totally understand that because we're in the same boat with our podcast. I mean, we don't make any money either. We're just two right. Aussie historians who enjoy talking 
about Ozzy the same way as you obviously do. And video is your format and audio is our format. So really, we're two birds of a feather here. So, yeah, we definitely understand and, and can appreciate the work that goes into it. Even for our show, we discuss it a lot on the podcast that we have to really make time to do the show because we have lived busy lives and it's hard. And when you're doing it as a labor of love, it can be very time consuming, but it's definitely rewarding just to see other people like yourself enjoying it. And I have to say, you know, give you guys compliments back. Just to be honest, I wasn't aware of your podcast before I think you guys posted something in the video. And I'm so glad you did because once I found your podcast and I started going through the episodes, not only were we like, man, these guys know their shit. They really know the backstory. They know the songs. They know how the music's played. But they also have a love for Ozzy and Sabbath. So props to you guys for making a, a very entertaining podcast. You know, I said something to my wife about it. She's like, and people listen to that? I'm like, yeah, they listen to it. It's, it's our yeah. love. It's our passion. And she wasn't dissing on you guys. It's just no. something to her. It's outside the norm, right? But to me, to find something like your guys' podcast is just such a cool thing to flip on. And, and uh, like I was listening to your Ultimate Sin episode, and I haven't listened to that album in 20 years. Wow. But today, I was I was going back through the songs and just enjoying a lot of it. So hats off to you guys as well. You're doing an awesome, awesome job. Thank you so yeah. much, man. Thank you. And, and- yeah, my wife doesn't understand it either, Alan. Like she totally doesn't get it. Well, 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 let me let me clarify this. My wife hasn't watched my Black Sabbath video, so <laughs> she definitely doesn't. And, and and I'm okay with that too, right? She's not a Sabbath fan, so I wouldn't want to watch Sex in the City with her. So uh, I'm fine that she doesn't watch my Black Sabbath video. Exactly right. the same. Yeah, my wife's never listened to the podcast. Dan, has yeah. your wife ever listened? She sure hasn't, but she's very supportive <laughs> of it, of course. I got to throw that out there, just like all our wives are. But no, my wife's a country girl, and I'm more of that metalhead guy, so absolutely not. Yeah, and just in case my wife does hear this, I love her dearly, and she's very supportive of me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I cover my bases. So before we get to the podcast, Alan, you know, you and I seem to be from about the same era, and Josh is a little younger than us. I'm going to take you back a little bit and kind of explain explore how you first discovered Sabbath in particular and kind of how your road got there and where that path has taken you. So ironically, I was uh, going to a Catholic school, uh, altar boy, et cetera. And one of my buddy's older brothers, where it usually comes from, had given him a uh, Black Sabbath record. And then he shared it with me. And I just kind of kept diving deeper and deeper into the well. And and throughout my teen years, it was just some of my most go-to records to listen to. Can I ask what year that was? Probably 82, 83. Man, we almost have the exact same story. By the way, I also went to a Catholic school and was a oh, boy. And no kidding. Uh, my brother's buddy brought home We Sold Our Soul for Rock and Roll. And this would have been 1981. And also brought home Diary of a Madman. So those were the two gateway albums for me. So almost an exact same story. That's kind of cool. A side story to that was I was in Spanish class. And they were like, you have to translate. Uh, you can translate whatever you want. You can even translate a song. So I translated After Forever. Ever. And of course, you guys all know the line about which is like to see the Pope on it in the rope. Yep. And I got in so much trouble for that. And I try to point out to them that was actually a positive song, but they weren't hearing anything about oh, it. Dude, I can't believe this. This is so crazy. So in my seventh and eighth grade in Catholic school, they would let me perform at the end of the year a fake Ozzy concert. And I'd go on stage <laughs> and, and mime Ozzy songs. But especially my seventh grade teacher, she was all in it. And I brought in Master Reality. And when I was showing her Lord of This World and and After Forever, and just how, you know, at the time, it related so much to Christianity and everything. I can't believe how similar path we followed. Was your teacher cool about it? That is crazy. Super cool. Uh, yeah, she couldn't believe that those were Black Sabbath lyrics, especially after Forever. Wow. Well, so let me put an asterisk by all that. I went to Catholic school first through eighth grade, and then my parents gave me the option of continually going to a Catholic school for high school or go to a public school. I was done wearing uniforms, so I chose the public school. So it was yeah. actually in the public school where the teacher freaked out about it, but she knew I came from a Catholic school, so she threatened to tell my priest about it. Oh so I don't God. know if my Catholic school would have been cool with it or not, but just funny. You would have been disturbing the priest, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I was just going to say, After Forever, is, we discussed it before on the show, as the first Christian metal song, really, in a lot of ways. It was so far ahead of its time. Yeah, but and, and I've heard that before, too. I, I guess my pushback on that would be a lot of the Christian metal stuff that I've heard is sucks, in, in my opinion, right? So I, No I, question. I, I, don't, I don't think Striper is the same as After Forever Sabbath. It definitely had the Christian elements, though, of 
speaking positively about religion versus a negative spin on it. Definitely parts of it for sure, but then other parts of it, not really. I don't think, again, I don't think Striper would say, would you like to see the Pope on the end of a rope? I think the difference for me, and it's always about Black Sabbath about this, to me, it's just so much more street level. Like, it's Geezer really talking from his perspective on life. And, you know, he also grew up in a very Catholic background like you and I did, Alan. And to me, it's just very street level. Like, it's not so pro-Christian as much as what is after, you know, life. The lyrics are brilliant, but I kind of agree with your point a little bit. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I can I, see I'm with you about the street level, for sure. The street level is a good way of putting it. So, Alan, when you decided to make a documentary about Black Sabbath, what brought you to the album Sabotage? You know, Sabotage is my favorite album. Dan stated earlier that it's his favorite Black Sabbath album. What made you decide to start with that one rather than the debut, which is your more typical choice for most people to begin with the first album? But you decided to go in hard with the sixth album. We did a similar thing like that with our podcast. You know, most people would have started with either Black Sabbath or with, you know, Randy Rhodes and the Blizzard of Oz, but we decided to open up with Osmosis, which I view as a very similar take as what you did choosing Sabotage. But what made you decide to choose that one? For me, one, yes, Sabbath. It's always tough to say which is Sabbath album is your favorite absolute, right? They're all different favorites for different reasons. It's hard to say that Paranoid's my favorite anymore because I've just heard it so much. Right. But if I was to hear it fresh again, maybe it would be my favorite. But on top of Sabotage being one of my favorite albums, for sure, just because of all the angst and anger that they had against the management, but it was also from a story side, I thought it would be so interesting to tell about their manager problems because... I wasn't 100% sure, you know, what happened then, et cetera. So in my mind, it's like I have interest in finding out the story, too. So it was two part. One was the music's excellent on the album. Ozzy sounds unreal on the album. And then the other part was is there's this interesting side story about how they got screwed by management. Yeah, no question. You know, the thing that really stuck with me watching the documentary is Don Arden went after them in 1970, right? I love how you told that story. What yes. state of mind had Black Sabbath had to be in for them to go back to him during the Never Say Die era. I mean, they had to be at their wits end at the bottom of the barrel because there was no way they were going to sign with Don Arden. And it just really struck me while I was watching the documentary that fucking like two more years after this, they wound up signing with Don Arden. You do mention that in the documentary, but can you just imagine where they had to be mentally to, to actually take the plunge to do that? I think that the thing that I've read over and over again is the Sabbath guys, one, they're good dudes, right? They're, yep. they, but they, they don't want confrontation either. They like just to play their music, write their songs, have concerts, and not deal with the business side. So so in my mind, I think part of what Don Arden is, is that he probably came back and, you know, painted a picture of, look, man, we're going to straighten all this stuff out. I'm going to work it out. Don't worry about it. And then there was the other part that who knows how much Sharon played into it at that time, too, with Ozzy. Maybe there was a little bit of flirtation at that time, too. Like, maybe there was something there that was connecting those bonds as well. But to answer your question, I think it's out of not knowing any better if Don Arden was going to do the best for them. But the one thing I don't understand and this was brought up in a couple comments, is why didn't they ever consider Peter Grant? I mean, Grant was right there with Zeppelin. They're buddies with Zeppelin. They're having management problems. And maybe they did look at this, but man, could you imagine if Peter Grant was their manager? I think it would have worked out much better for them. It's an excellent point. Yeah, no question. Do you guys I know don't, why? I mean, I know. I, you know, it's a great point. No, I do not no, know why. And I know, I've never, obviously, Bonham and uh, Robert Plant were Tony. great friends to the band, right? Yeah. So that, yeah. That, that's a great point. That could have taken them to an even additional level, right? Especially at that time, because like you said, confrontation was just not a thing in Sabbath, right? If they were been able to speak with Ozzy towards the end there in, you know, 77, 78, they probably could have worked things out. I mean, they were brothers. You know, they talk about it all the time, how they, the thing they're most proud of is how they grew up together and made it right Absolutely. but they were so afraid of confrontation they couldn't even have a conversation with ozzy about his struggles let's be honest about it too i would hope that they could work it out but they're i mean i'm not like an anti-drug guy but they were doing a lot of drugs and alcohol at the oh, time yeah. too so i think that probably clouds their mind as well so in 77 78 i don't know if they could have worked it out without at least getting cleaned up first Good um point. 
so that was just part of it, right? Part of it was that, but you're right about the other part of it was is they didn't want confrontation, so they wouldn't bring up problems, and the problems would just brew underneath, and it just it just fractured. So, and you know, also like you mentioned in the documentary, Ozzy flirted with Juan Solo in 1976. So it was a brief run, but it definitely is something that he had already contemplated and had been on his mind anyway. So yeah, there was definitely a lot going on within the group at that point. I think that the way I framed it up was actually in one of my books that mentioned that Ozzy, "Am I Going Insane?" Radio was actually actually was an Aussie song that he was looking at doing for going solo. That's, I think, what I was referencing in that, not the later solo part, unless I'm misremembering my own video. Uh, no, no, that's correct. It's either after Sabotage or after Technical Ecstasy, he got with those Necromandus guys and started to work up solo yeah. material. Yeah. No, you're right. He did do that. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying in, in the documentary, what I brought up was the first time he was talking about going solo. Yeah, was yeah. Bef- way before that. No yeah, question. for sure. Yeah, I mean, even uh, the Blizzard of Oz was his dad's idea to call the band the Blizzard of Oz. And I think that was around 75, 76, right? That his dad had the idea of calling his band the Blizzard of Oz if he went solo. Yeah, right. I don't know if Blizzard of Oz was an idea in 70, what, 74 when no. he originally was looking at it. But maybe it was. I don't yeah. know. Doesn't about No, 70s. no, I clearly got it that he wanted to do a, like a solo thing separate not impossible. yeah yeah cool so speaking with am i going insane radio i love that part obviously josh and i know that radio was for that radio rental meaning mental but i kind of want to explore because you do hit on the fact that this seems to be the song that on this record that people kind of disparage a little bit and look down upon i actually think it's a great song it definitely seems like it's a blueprint for ozzy solo that's coming in a couple of years i think the verse melody is absolutely fantastic and the chorus is just okay but i don't think it's near the shit that people kind of put on it yeah i'm kind of on the other side brother um it's 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 an automatic skip for me maybe it's because i've just listened to it too much uh maybe it's because it's too catchy and it just rings out through my head all the time but that album sabotage is almost an anger level it's almost like rage against machine anger for 1975 and to me that song doesn't really come through like that so just a little too poppy for you based on yeah, a little yeah, bit with, for, with, with record that. is. See, I, I think that it ebbs and flows really, really well with the record personally, because it gives you that breath of fresh air before the brilliant The Writ, which ends the record, which is one of my all-time favorite songs. So I'm not saying it's on that level, but I don't think it's the crap that people say it is. It's an enjoyable, great little pop song that Sabbath did. Yeah, and the transition from it's Am I Glad Insane into The Writ is just so perfect, man. The the baby cries into what sounds more like you know the, the roar of death. It's just so fucking great. I love the transition between the two tracks. I do like that part. Yeah, I could never hear sure. The Writ without that intro. I think that's a great point, Josh, because it's like such a peak right and then everything just kind of cuts out to that cool little bass effect geezer is doing it's just such a great transition yeah for sure so alan tell us you released this documentary we haven't mentioned this yet i apologize we should have already stated this part but it was released january 13th 2022 just a few weeks back what roughly was the date you started working on this actually going into production on doing this documentary i have a day job right so this is one of those things where i do it after work or on the weekends uh which is fine but it just takes a a lot longer to do over a period of time. So I probably started mid-October of last year and then spent probably until December researching. And then early December, I laid down like all the vocal parts. And then the last three weeks is when I did all the video stuff. And I was off work for like two weeks for the Christmas break. And that's where I really went at hard, nine, 10 hours a day. At that point, I think it would take me a full day to get like a minute, a minute and a half of uh, completed video. It's just a very, very slow process when you're trying to... I try to have every 10 seconds, there needs to be something happening. Otherwise, people get bored. So I'm just trying to cram as much good information and make it visually pleasing, but then also in the background have some kind of cool music going, etc. I kind of went long-winded on your answer, but I started in mid-October, and then I finished it probably uh, one week before the 13th in January. That's awesome. I mean, that is incredible how long it takes to just get a minute and a half of film documentary to, you know, a full day. That's great. So my question is, from an editing standpoint, because you want something exciting happening every 10 seconds, how long was the original final piece before you edited it down? Did you know you always wanted to do a half hour? Was that always the game plan? Or did you have like a 50 minute version that we whittled down? One thing about video to me is that 
there's never really a set time. It's more about how long can you make it engaging? You know what I mean? So if you can, if the video is only going to be engaging for five minutes, then don't make it for 10 minutes, right? So I never had like a time set of, oh, I'm going to make this part or whatever. My first thing was to write out a script. And so it's probably that the script was longer before I got to the video part. So as a video editor, I'm always conscious of, I don't want to start editing video until I know exactly what the story is, exactly what the script is, et cetera. So by the time I got to actually editing the video, it was pretty much concrete in because I'd already done the voiceover part, et cetera. So the longer part was probably the script, but that got chopped down. It was always going to be 30 minutes. There was a couple things that I changed and I added, like the thing about the underwear and the Sabotage album cover. Right. Yeah, I was just staring <laughs> yeah. at it. And I was like, wait a minute. Is that the same pair of underwears that he was? And I was like, holy shit. Yeah, so okay. like, I added that in. There's only a few parts that I took. Out. Like I had a part where bands that were covering Symptoms of the Universe. But then I thought, man, does this really add any value to the viewer? I decided not. To, so I cut it out. But for the most part, the 30 minute video is, what I started with is what I ended with. I think it's perfect. I mean, we live in a society now where everything's now, 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 and everything's compressed. And I think 30 minutes is perfect. I mean, had that video been 90 minutes long, I'm not sure it would have had the success that it's had with the views on YouTube and so on and so forth, because people just don't feel like they have time to watch a 90 minute video on YouTube anymore. You know what I'm saying? In, in the eighties and nineties, we'd have ate that up, but today they just don't care for that. And that's a fair point, but my pushback on that. So part of my day job is video strategy, online video strategy strategy is that if it's compelling people will watch it for as many hours as you can make it compelling just look at all the series you know on netflix whatever you know the five episode mini series or my go-to thing is always titanic you know how the story is going to end it's over two hours long but it's one of the biggest movies of all time why because camera makes it engaging throughout most of the movie for most people so i hear you on that maybe 30 minutes was the right time but if i had a shitload more of great facts and information you would have watched it for an hour if you're a Sabbath fan. That's you true. Watched it for two hours. I would watch it for. Engaged. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. So, so, yeah, that's true. So it comes back to engagement. How long can you keep the viewer engaged with good information? And how you do that is you provide them value. And so a lot of times people will make videos longer that just don't provide the viewer value, so people turn it out. No, I agree totally. And Titanic is a great example. A matter of fact, I saw that on TV like three nights ago and watched it. When, oh God! When the ship starts going down, man, I'm in. I can't help it. It's fucking. It looks great. It holds up to this day, so I'm, I'm in. So I did want to ask this question because it definitely jumped out at me because I've seen so many different documentaries that don't use authentic music. I thought it was really cool that you were able to get the rights to use the actual Sabbath material. What was that process like and was that hard to, to, to get? Yeah, so I never got a right for any of it. How that works is when you see other, and there's plenty of other YouTube channels that do like these type of rock docs, et cetera, that's kind of been of an expanding genre on YouTube. There's several channels that do it. The reason they don't use the band's real music is because they wouldn't be able to monetize the video. And so what happens on YouTube is when I use all the Sabbath music, they say, hey, look, this isn't your music, so you can't monetize it. The owner of this music is going to monetize it. So whoever owns Sabbath music, which at this point I believe is Ozzy and Tony and Sharon or whatever, they're actually making the money from any commercials that go on that video. So I don't have to go get directly from them the rights to use the music. But on the backside, Sabbath has said, it's cool, you can use this music, but we're going to make the money from it. Most bands are that way today, but there's still some bands that don't do that. Like if you had a Beatles song, I'm pretty sure the Beatles are going to be like, you can't use this at all. The other part of it for me is I hate, I fucking hate rock documentaries that don't use the band's music. To me, it just takes away everything from that documentary. If I'm going to watch a band's documentary, it better have the music in there. So I came to it from me as a viewer, what would I want to see or hear? And if I'm watching a Sabbath documentary, I want to hear Sabbath music. So that's how I made it. Absolutely, it's a great man. call. Great Absolutely. Call. Yeah, for sure. And let's face it, my channel is monetized, but you're not going to make that much money anyways. I mean, even if it had over a million views, you're going to get, what, a thousand bucks? And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying a thousand dollars isn't good money. It is. But 
to subject people to not having the music to me is just not worth it. And without the music, would you have the million views? You yeah. Know? So yeah, it, it's all. Well, it's a good point, but surprisingly, I'm not going to name names, but there's a couple channels that I'm amazed how many views they get. And it sounds like to me, they're all they're doing is reading from a script and showing pictures pan in and pan out. And they'll get 300,000 views on XYZ Band did this and this. And I'm amazed by it. So, yeah. so yes, I think some people will watch it without the music, but I prefer to have the music, so I put in the music. But yeah, see, that goes back to what we were saying earlier about it being a labor of love, and you're doing this out of your passion for the music. You would rather the documentary be as good as it could be versus make some extra money on it. And that's something I can totally relate with, and I'm sure Dan could also. And that's, you know, I, I agree totally. I did the same thing. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So one of the things that I loved that you mentioned in the documentary, and we even have this uh, podcast talking about Ozzy's best vocal performances in Black Sabbath, that you really mentioned how great Ozzy sounds on The Thrill of It All. To me, that was my number one choice, by the way, out of his whole catalog. I think it's the song he sounds the best. Not talking melody or anything, but the power and the passion on the whole album, really. But for some reason, The Thrill of It All, to me, really stood out. So I love that you called that out. Yeah, I don't know that I can add much more to your point other than I agree. And I don't know what was going on at the time. Was it some type of studio thing or was it just Ozzy's place and time there? But man, it just sounds so. But oh, maybe this is a good point. Here's the downside to all that is that a lot of those songs, it was tough for him to perform live because a lot of the time he was in a higher registered voice, right? So it just made it tough to perform live. So Wait. on one hand, it was great to hear it on the album. But on the other hand, a lot of those songs, I don't think they ever played live. Or if they did, they didn't play them many times because it would just tear up Ozzy's voice. Well, you know why that was is because they did and tune them properly so they record those songs tuned to c sharp when they went out live they played them an e standard you mm. know that he was having to sing those songs a step and a half higher than he did even, on the even yeah even higher than he recorded them yeah. yeah so why didn't they just play them with and c sharp then i mean i they have, have no idea that's why i love speak of the devil so much because randy was the one that really started doing that on tribute he didn't change guitars he just transforms children of the grave to c sharp and he played it on the fourth fret and ozzy was able to sing it in his natural register because he was playing it with iron man which is tuned to e so you know randy was just ahead of his time with that sort of stuff but sabbath didn't do that if you play a Along with any of those live recordings, they're playing in standard. So I guess maybe Tony didn't want to change guitars or something. Yeah. If you listen to the Never Say Die Live DVD and how high they are on Symptom of the Universe when they open that up, that's why Ozzy sounds so gravelly and just like he's completely maxed out because they're tuned up so high. So are you saying that? So like when they toured with because Master Reality, my understanding, you guys are the you guys are both guitar players, right? Yeah. Yeah, you guys will probably get this better than me, but my understanding is that when they first tuned down tuned to down. C sharp. Correct. So, are you saying when they toured on that record, they still played to E as opposed to tuning down to C sharp? So, I haven't played along with that particular tour, but definitely in the later tours when Ozzy, you know, I would say probably starting with the California Jam, play along with those live records, and Tony would be tuned to E instead of C sharp. Yeah, got to believe Tony knew that though, right? I mean, they I, had to have had that conversation think. or that thought. You uh, absolutely, you would think. yeah, yeah he would. Think think but poor Ozzy's having to sing think about how high symptom of the universe is so what a lot of listeners don't understand the lower you tune the higher the singer can go in his register because you're starting from a lower point so when they would go out and tour like symptom of the universe is in the key of e right tony plays it on the third fret which would be the key of e and when they would play it live he'd play it in the third fret but he'd have a standard tuning guitar so he'd be playing it in the key of g which is a step and a half higher you know i've read in many places that tony was quite the prankster maybe this is just a big joke he played on Ozzy all those oh. years. Yeah, and Ozzy wouldn't know. We all know that for a yeah, fact. Ozzy, uh, yeah, Ozzy yeah, would just be out there singing know. probably going, fuck, it's how like I Tony's little joke yeah. himself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, Alan, check it out. You or any of the listeners, go back and listen to those later tours and songs like Symptom of the Universe, and they're just so high, man. It's almost painful. To, when you really listen to Ozzy's voice, it's almost painful to listen to it. It's, it's so hard for him to hit those notes. Yeah. So, you're, why, so from what you guys are saying then, and this is something I've learned today, is that actually they could have been playing songs off of Sabbath live if they would have tuned properly live yeah, yeah. i believe so yeah wow. yeah and if you really listen to it think about how ozzy is just obviously i have to give the preamble we all love ozzy that's why we're doing this but even when he was going back and singing iron man and those songs that were tuned to e his voice just didn't sound the same i think he was just so fucked up vocally because he didn't know what the hell was coming or going with those keys he even sounds high almost chipmunk like on the classic songs during those tours interesting 
Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I think he was a little confused, man. I think it also affected his voice for years to come. I mean, even when the Blizzard of Oz started and he went solo, you know, it's well known that throughout those tours, he always had vocal issues and this and that. And I think a lot of it just became from the confusion of not knowing really where he was even supposed to be on a lot of those tracks. Until Randy. Until Randy really settled in on it. And it was kind of, yeah. So it, it's interesting. I remember being a young guitar player. I was probably 13 when I started getting really serious about it. And Randy's easily my favorite guitar player. And I remember learning Children of the Grave from Tribute. And like Dan said, I had already knew it from the Sabbath version. And then in Tribute, when it's totally different. I, at the time, I didn't understand why it was different. You know, I'd never understood key and this and that. And I was like, man, like Randy plays is totally different. But, you know, it and took growing into it to understand that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Randy really wasn't that thrilled about playing Sabbath songs, right? He, it wasn't like he was shitting on Sabbath, but that wasn't really his thing. He was kind of like, really? We're going to play Black Sabbath songs? Yeah, definitely. Maybe early on 100%. he understood why, but he was never yeah. a huge fan. Which I kind of love, and then I kind of don't get at the same time, because... Right. What guitar player doesn't, especially in metal, well, I guess I'm answering my own question because, you know, you say, well, yeah. what metal guitar player didn't like Sabbath? But Randy really was moving away from metal. But but even before he met Ozzy, I don't think he was a big metal guy. He was more of a David Bowie, Alice Cooper style. Leslie West. Yeah, Leslie West. Yeah, so mm -hmm. he was not really a metal guy. Hmm. But yeah. what an impact he had on metal. Oh, metal yeah, rock. exactly. Well, right. I think bringing that classical background just changed everything. Yeah. I would like to see Tony Iommi, and not a stick on Tony because, you know, Tony Tony's the riff master, etc. But could you imagine the look on Tony Iommi's face when he first heard Randy Rhodes playing? I mean, that had to been holy shit. Had to yeah, be. no question. Had Absolutely. To you know, Tony's answer to that is, well, it really wasn't a big deal. We toured with Van Halen in 78, so I didn't think a whole lot about it. That's his answer, but he still had to fucking... Come he on. Had to be yeah, yeah. Exactly. Ozzy was exactly. like his ex-wife dating this new hot stud. Agreed. Absolutely. Exactly. And I think all of us would feel that way. There would always be some little bit of resentment. You know what I mean? That the new hot young kid was dating your old ex-wife or whatever yeah. so it's not a, again it's not a stick on tony it's just how we are and the same for ozzy i mean he had the dwarf who would come out on stage right and he named him ronnie which is <laughs> right. clearly a, which is clearly <laughs> yeah, a jab at ronnie james deal for being short right i mean but, and then he hangs him at the end of the show i mean come on so that goes both ways really yeah so, Alan, what is the next project you have planned, and what are you working on currently? So, that's a that's a great question, because what do you do next, right? In all honesty, I really wanted to cover Never Say Die, Technical Ecstasy, and moving from Ozzy to Dio, because I think it's just rich in backstory, lots of conflict, which that's what makes good stories, etc. But I thought, you know, let me see what everybody else is thinking. So, I threw up, I think, four different polls, one on Twitter, one on Facebook, one on Reddit, and one somewhere else and all of them came back to master of reality and which is a great album i thought okay beautiful you know i, I like master reality so in one way you know people pick master reality which is great right i mean master reality like you guys did a great in-depth uh what was it master reality versus paranoid right and uh it was just excellent because i was listening to you guys some of the things i agreed with some of the things i didn't agree with but overall i was in pretty much agreement with your list etc so it's interesting but what i'm finding is is there's not as many great behind the scenes stories to share and that's my struggle right now is finding those tidbits of information that i don't want to state the stuff that's been overstated time and time again i want to have some new nuggets to put in there and i'm finding that difficult whereas i think with the technical xc never say die and the transition there would have been more of those stories so the way i'm approaching it now is i'm finding other angles about Sabbath at that time to kind of tell those stories. And one of them being Ozzy getting married. Another one of them is about how they really didn't want to think of themselves as a band that worships Satan and how they were trying to shake that off. Um, but overall, if you guys could pick any album for me to do next, what would you guys have chosen? That's actually a pretty good question, Alan. I understand totally what you're trying to say about your dilemma between Master of Reality or Technical Ecstasy and Never Said I, but my advice to you would be go with your gut. If your gut tells you that Technical Ecstasy Never Say Die era would tell a better story, I would go with that 100% because I think you approach that the same way we do the podcast. We try to tell the stories that aren't so told. One thing we've said from the trailer on is we're not really going to go on here and discuss biting the heads off bats or pissing on the Alamo. You know, we all know those stories. They've been told a million times. We want to talk about everything else. You know, we want to talk about what fans may not know yet. So I agree with you that I think Technical Ecstasy Never Say Die would be the better story. 
I was going to say, which is a very fair point. And it's something that, in my mind, that's the dilemma I had too. But then I thought about it from another angle. I thought, you know what? I should challenge myself to figure out how to make Master of Reality telling that story as interesting as Sabotage was. Find other angles to do it. So that's where I'm at with it now. It's like, yeah, I could do technical X, see, never say die, the transition would be great. But why not challenge myself as a storyteller to take this thing that I think is going to be more difficult and make it work? So at this point, I have a certain amount of sunken cost already into it, not dollars, but hours. I've already spent, I think, two weekends of research, etc. So and I've already started with the script. So I'm kind of getting uh, at least ankle deep in it. So I don't know if I'm going to bail from it at this point, but I will bail from it if I get the script done and my small group of people says, dude, that script sucks if that yeah. comes back then i will tear it up and i'll probably go the other way yeah but to answer your question the album i would have chosen has already been done which is sabotage that's my favorite black sabbath <laughs> record but my next choice would be actually technical ecstasy because i think it's an era that simply isn't explored very much that it, seems to, always, point. it yeah. seems to always be glossed over yeah exactly. i agree that's the same reason i won't do paranoid is because paranoid has been told so many times sabbath actually has their own paranoid documentary i, I just don't see any reason to ever cover paranoid I agree. That's why we haven't started with Blizzard or Diary or Paranoid. I mean, we did do the battle with Paranoid, but we're choosing more off-the-wall records for sure, just for that same exact reason, which is why my guess would have been Technical Ecstasy or Never Say Die, or both, because those are two records that I... And I was going to ask this question, so I'm so glad you brought this up. They seem to be kind of shit on the most from the Aussie era, and I, of course, love them both. I think they're totally misunderstood and great records, but there is just not a lot of documentation out there on those two albums, and I'd love to see them more brought to the light. Yeah. Yeah, and you know... I I said something at the end of the video about uh, about the wheels coming off, and I wish I would have phrased that differently because I wasn't really, I didn't want to come across like I was shitting on technical ecstasy and never say die because I'm like you guys. I mean, do I think it's as good as Sabotage? No, but they're great albums. I like Absolutely. those albums, yeah. and there's many songs on there that I love, right? They're great stuff. So I did get some comments on YouTube saying, yeah, why are you shitting on technical ecstasy? So I was like, oh man, I wish I wouldn't have said it like that because well, that was not what I meant. I took yeah. it as Ozzy was about ready to leave the band, and on top of that, their album sales have really plummeted after Sabotage. Even yeah. though, and we're going to talk about it again, Sabotage record sales were not great in, the, in America, but after Sabotage, their album sales really plunged with Ozzy. So that's kind of how I took it, that yeah. Ozzy was crumbling in the band, and alcoholism and drug use was getting worse, and then, of course, their album sales just wasn't yeah. on the par. Yeah, and I never take it as technical ways to see and never said I sucked. I just take it as the beginning of the end, and it was. That was when the end started started to happen that was when the wheel started to fall off i totally understood how you said that yeah okay perfect well good and, and you know like an idiot i'm going through the youtube comments well not not like an idiot there's an algorithm to side of that too i don't know if you guys are aware of that but if you look in the comments i replied to i mean just hundreds and hundreds of comments one because i wanted to be friendly to people and have the conversation but two it pushes the algorithm so youtube says oh you're engaging with this audience let's make sure we share it to more people yeah, hey, for I'll, sure. I'll tell you, you type in Black Sabbath for uh, YouTube, it was the third video that popped up. So, oh, wow. impressive. Yeah. That is, yeah, I'm amazed by that. Yeah. So, yeah. that's awesome. Well, well again, 377,000 plus views in two weeks, man. That's fucking phenomenal. I couldn't be more excited for you. That's amazing. The only thing I hope for at this point is somebody fly from Sabbath, one of the band members, I hope saw it, you know? And uh, I hope when they watched it, I hope that they didn't think, oh, who's this sucks or whatever. I hope they enjoyed it. I know I mispronounced a few things that people called me out on, which absolutely they should call me out on it. I'm a borderline idiot half the time, and I can't tell you how many times I went into Google and said, how do you say this? And Google has a feature where it pronounces it for you, but there's a few words that, like Meehan, I'm still not 100% sure how you say that, if it's Meehan or Meehan, but I annoyed quite a few British people on how I said some of those <laughs> oh. words. I would have said Meehan, I think. I would have said Meehan also. <laughs> we couldn't figure out how to say Phil Sassan. I still don't don't say it right so yeah you're preaching yeah. to the choir on that one michael beanhorn from the osmosis record dan and i went, went back and forth on that one phil susan i say phil susan i feel pretty comfortable with that one but yeah who knows man we've been reading these names and liner notes our whole lives and in books but you never actually hear anyone say the name directly so who knows how you say it i guess my point with that was is that i wasn't trying to be flipping on how to say these words i actually tried to because I, I think right. that that is important too to try to get the names right so i did try but obviously i fucked up on a few of those do you have a favorite track off Sabotage, Alan? 
probably the writ. It's a good yeah. one. I love that you brought to the attention that Ozzy wrote the lyrics because again, Ozzy gets crucified for some fucking reason that he doesn't do much writing. And, yeah. and maybe I should bring up this point too. All my facts in my video, I researched, right? And I double checked and I cross referenced from one book to another book to a forum, etc. But what I'm learning is is that a lot of this stuff is still kind of unknown. So when I say that Ozzy wrote the lyrics to the writ, do I know 100% that Geezer didn't add any of that? I don't, right? But most of the pointers led to me that Ozzy did write it. So it's always so weird when when I write some of those things as fact, because in reality, I don't even think any of the guys in Sabbath know 100%. I would say everything I've read is Ozzy wrote the lyrics to the writ. I, yeah. I definitely would back that argument up. So I do think you nailed it. Just like the song Black Sabbath. Ozzy wrote the lyrics to Black Sabbath. But I have seen a couple of little things here and there that people think Geezer wrote it. But I've seen interviews directly where geezer says ozzy wrote the lyrics about an experience geezer had yeah no and that's the other thing too if anybody ever calls me out on i'm i'm more than open to say one if you're right about it then school me on it correct me show me where the documentation is or whatever and i'll be happy not happy to be wrong but i'm fine with it but i can also show where i got this information i got it from this book now maybe this book is wrong and i'll give you a case in point so researching master of reality there's a couple books and websites that say that Black Sabbath opened up for Led Zeppelin. But I cannot find anything to back that up. It's not so true. I'm going to say that it was false. Yeah. Because there's no concert reviews. There's nothing materialized that actually shows that. So I feel comfortable in saying it didn't happen. Yeah, it's not true. And sometimes you got to be careful, too, because even like on Master of Reality, if you look at the liner notes on the original record, it says all tracks by... <laughs> you know, Iomi Osborne, Ward Butler, except After Forever by Iomi. And it's obviously a misprint because they probably meant Embryo or Orchid, right? You know, even on a Black Sabbath album, it looks like Tony Iomi. And as a, you know, 12, 13 year old kid, I thought Tony Iomi wrote the lyrics to After Forever. But again, it was just a misprint. Yeah. I'll tell you another misprint that got me a little bit. I mean, I'm going to use this as my excuse is in one of my polls, I said masters of reality, plural. And then somebody said, you know, dude, it's master singular. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right, right, right. But then come to find out, there was a bunch of the records that were printed with masters, plural. So you're right. Sometimes the band themselves or the management, they'll make the mistakes. And then those mistakes get repeated over and over again. Yeah, Ozzy's name is misspelled on Black Sabbath. I mean, <laughs> shit like that happens all the time, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. We have the same dilemma with our show. You feel like... Once you put yourself out there publicly, you know, you have a documentary, we have a podcast, and you feel like once you state something, you better damn well know it's a fact. Because at that point, you're going to be referenced as the person that said it was a fact. There's definitely a pressure to that, no question about it. But but I think it goes back to your intent, too, right? You guys are intending to tell what you know is to be Right. And so am I. My intent was to only provide information that I believe is right. And I did my due diligence to try to double check that. Now, if I end up being wrong, it wasn't a nefarious reason that I did it. Yeah. And the one advantage we have over you is we can always correct ourselves the next week. You know, we yep. said on, on the Ultimate Sin podcast, we said that never had never been played live. And within a day, a, a, a YouTube subscriber corrected us that it had been played over on the European tour and even Ice. sent us you know, the dates and stuff. Um, matter of fact, at the beginning of this episode, the listeners have already heard it. We corrected that. So, that, you know, at least we have that that we can fall back on. No, good on you. I guess I'm using yeah. this platform too, just to let everybody know that <laughs> I, I get it, man. I'm going to make mistakes in the videos for sure, but I spend days upon days to try to not do that and source yeah. after source, you know, going back and forth in different books. Well, and these stories are 50 years old, so you always have different versions of them also. You know what I mean? It's so hard. Who knows what the actual truth is to any of it because you have this version and that version and that version. You kind of have to go between and find the truth. Yeah, and Tony and Ozzy and Geezer and Bill, their, their recollections are different too. I mean, I've straight yeah. up seen where Tony has said something where it's like, dude, that didn't happen. Or just like they say Master of Reality was recorded in a 24-track. No, it wasn't. That studio was not a 24-track at that time. So I'd say the part that I love, it's about a minute of your documentary, is <laughs> the little coverage you do on Blow on a Jug. I love it. I love the fact that you mentioned the Mungo Jerry part, which is awesome, which obviously Bob Day's late future Aussie bassist played with Mungo Jerry as well. Thank you. Kudos for doing that. How did you go about researching that? Obviously, we knew it was Bill and Ozzy, but you know, where'd you get some of that information? First of all, th thank you. That was always an odd track to me because when I had the tape when I was, I don't know, 12, 13 or whatever, 
I was like, what is it? Is it? Did I get a bad tape? Is this not, is this tape not, what is this? Like, I didn't even know it was Sabbath or what. And it was just something me and my brother were just always like, what is this? So that always intrigued me. So the 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 fact that kept coming to me was is that it was a cover song of the Nitty Gritty Band. No matter how I Googled it, I could not find anything with it, right? I think it was just dumb luck that I ended up finding that information about going back to that festival with Mungo Jerry and getting that actual quote. So Sometimes my research is very purposeful, and then other times I'm just I just dumb luck into finding something on the web that's legit, like an old magazine or an old newspaper where it has a quote, et cetera. So I wish I could tell you it was a I was a genius in searching that out, but if I remember correctly, it just kind of fell to me. I was like, oh shit, here this is how they did it. That that other story is wrong. This is the right story. I clearly hear Ozzy singing and blow on a jug. That's definitely his voice for sure. The one thing about Ozzy that people don't give him enough credit for is how different he can sound. You know, how many years did we have to hear it wasn't him on Planet Caravan and Solitude, which it's yeah. clearly Ozzy. You know, the guy definitely has a lot more vocal sides to him that people realize. Back in the day, I get why we questioned it because there was no other real way to find out too, right? right so right, right. I, I'm sure I questioned it when I was younger too. And I'm going to be embarrassed to ask, but what's the 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 cut that Ward sings on? It's, it's all, all right. right. Yeah. I remember, I remember being like, who's singing that? It's a fair point. You know, when my brother brought home, uh, we sold our sofa rock and roll, which we already discussed. The first time I heard Wicked World, I thought at first that that maybe might not be Ozzy because, you know, I was just getting into Sabbath and Ozzy and he even sounds a little bit different on that song. But to your point, I think Ozzy's not given enough credit. OK, is he a, is he a technically a great singer? No. But as a front man, he's one of the best. He puts on a show. He has his own authentic way of singing. You absolutely knows it knows it's Ozzy when you hear him. And he, he comes up with these great melodies, etc. He doesn't he doesn't really even play an instrument, but he's able to do all these things. So, yeah, I agree. As a musician, he's I think he's underappreciated sometimes. Hey, hey, he does play an instrument. You brought it up yeah. in your documentary. He plays the jug. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> and the harmonica. <laughs> and the keyboard. And the harmonica. <laughs> yeah. He does play a little bit, but you know what I'm saying. A yeah, hundred percent, man. I'm yeah, sure. Ozzy's voice, it just has so much character. It's just it's the character of his voice that makes it so perfect. But one thing I wanted to mention also on Blowing a Jug, I had a good friend who watched your documentary, and he messaged me. He said, I've never heard this, and I've had sabotage my whole life. And I kind of had to explain to him, and so some listeners may understand this also, it was on all the pressings. It would kind of show up on this pressing, not on the next one, then on the next one, then not on the next one. So it was kind of, you know, you never knew from pressing to pressing if it was going to be included or not. So, yeah. They had no quality control either. They It was really flippant how the rights over here was distributed. The album was from this master, and then over here was done a different way. And then all of a sudden, you're looking at a bargain bin of cassette tapes, and you see some oddball Sabbath album that you never heard of before. One of the parts of the documentary that I really liked that was also a quick blimp on the entire thing was the California Jam and bringing attention to the fact that the band oh, was yeah. paid a quarter million dollars but only received a thousand bucks each roughly. It's just crazy to think that that could happen to anyone because you know, I don't think it could happen today, but it did happen to bands often back in the 70s and, and before. I don't know, man. I think it can still happen today. I mean, they do creative accounting everywhere. I've heard it many times of, of modern movies where like people have back end deals to where they make their real money after it's profitable, but somehow movies that make seven, eight hundred million dollars are never profitable. So creative accounting is still around today for sure. And if you think about it from on the Sabbath side, it was probably them being paid a th or four thousand dollars total out of a quarter of a million dollars is probably on par with the overall picture too. You know, if they made a million, if they grossed a million dollars on X, Y, and Z, they were probably only getting twenty, thirty thousand dollars of that. Because to these four guys from Birmingham, they grew up poor, so just them being able to have twenty, thirty thousand bucks probably seemed like a lot. So I don't know. It does seem surprising on the outside looking in, but I think when you're inside of it, I definitely can see how it happens. I would tend to believe that it still happens today. Who knows if he wasn't also telling the guys, yeah, we're going to put the rest of this money towards your homes and your cars, because you remember, that was the deal. Hey, I want a Rolls Royce. Sure, here you go. But even though it wasn't their car, it was in Patrick Meehan's name. Yeah. But who the hell knows if he wasn't like just kind of blowing smoke up their ass with that sort of shit as well, saying, hey, well, we got to pay your house off and this and that. So, you know, we'll give you $1,000 and walk around cash for the show. And it goes back to the confrontation. They didn't want the confrontation, right? So even if they thought that they got stiffed at California Jam, they were probably like, ah, 
fuck it. I, I don't want to. I don't want to bring that up. I don't want the confrontation or whatever. It's fine. I mean, I think that there's that part of it too. I think they were just four guys who felt so lucky to be where they were that they were just so afraid to question it and and have it fall apart at any moment. You know, like you can go back to the factory, right? Yeah. Yeah, who wants to go back to Birmingham and work in the factory? Let's just let's just take it for what it is and assume this is how it is for everybody. Yeah, and they but they were living comfortable lifestyles, right? They're living very comfortable lifestyles. But what they I think they probably didn't get was the exponential and more money that they were actually generating that they could have had, right? So they were living a, a high tiered lifestyle, but they probably didn't understand how much better it could have been. Well, they started to, right? And that's when they they started uh, to to break away when they started realizing that. But at the time, it wasn't like they were starving. Obviously, Sabotage did not do the numbers that the band was expecting, right? You know, I'm not going to call it a flop by any stretch of the imagination. It was definitely their least selling album up until that time. So why do we think that the album didn't catch fire in America like some of their previous records? I mean, I think part of it could be the album cover is god-awful. You know, it could be a couple of things like that. We've talked about that in the past. But why do you think, Alan, that, that Sabotage just did not take off like it should have, like the previous records? Man, that's that's a great question. I don't think it's the album cover because actually I think I, I get why people would think it's horrible. But I also heard a lot of people say they love it. And, you know, I when I was a kid, <laughs> yeah, when I was a kid looking at it, yeah. I liked it, too, because I was always trying yeah. to find some hidden meaning. Oh, what what's this over here? Does this mean something? Yeah. I don't think it was the album cover. I guess if I want to play devil's advocate and and not to say anything great about Meehan, but maybe it was Meehan. Maybe Meehan did pull strings on the other records that fellas didn't know about because they were self managing at that point, and maybe there was something that Meehan would do on the other albums did push those records out. So when I look at old newspapers for Master of Reality, when I'm looking at archives. There are advertisements all across the United States, hundreds and hundreds of advertisements for that record. I don't know if the same thing happened with Sabotage. So maybe the downside to losing Meehan was actually that maybe they they did lose somebody that knew how to push out a record. But other than that, I don't know, man, because the album is solid. Sabotage to me is it's everything I definitely want out of a Black Sabbath record from start to finish. It's got it hits all four corners. Let me just clarify on the cover. I find it very endearing. As the time has gone on, it, I fucking love the cover. So definitely, I'm not ripping on the cover. But imagine coming off of the Sabbath Bloody Sabbath cover in 1973, and then this you know, year and a half later comes out. It's so different. I don't, I don't know. I could just see it at the time being, like, being caught off well, guard on the cover. Well, imagine so, coming off of the Sabotage cover to the Technical Ecstasy fucking cover. I mean, yeah, I don't <laughs> like that cover very well. I like Sabotage yeah, I much either. better. Yeah, yeah I don't so, like that one either. So, I mean, if I was in the band at the time, I would have been disappointed for sure because that wasn't the vision. That right. wasn't the vision that they were trying to accomplish. If I was at the band, I would have been pissed about the album cover. But I think it's own, in some ways, it's just like I said, it, it has become endearing. It's actually a great album cover, and, and I it's much better than technical ecstasy but you know if you look at volume four it is an iconic album cover but on the surface by itself it's not that impressive but for some reason it has become an iconic cover of ozzy on the front and I, I'd, I'd like to know the backstory on that too so there's egos involved how did they decide on having ozzy on the cover that just seemed like an odd choice too well they each get their own panel within the record because it's a gatefold i think at that time yeah. it was an iconic pose i mean i think they knew that Ozzy did that live. Like that was a picture of their live show. That big peace sign was such a big part of their live show. And I think the guys kind of knew that as Lars even says in the don't blame me documentary, Ozzy was the guy that was iconic, you know, back in the day, Tony barely moved, you know, geezer was great live on stage, but think about it from 1972. There was nothing really like Ozzy at that point live. I mean, maybe Robert Plant a little bit, but Ozzy was kind of insane with, you know, him shaking his head and scratching himself and just, you know, the head banging really, you know, I don't see much head banging before Ozzy, you know, you watch some of that 1970s show from the paranoid tour. God, Ozzy is insane on that, you know, just incredibly insane. And, and I agree with you hundred percent. Ozzy was a, no doubt about it. He's a great front man, et cetera, but I came across this. So as I'm researching master of reality, so one of the first 
tour dates was a, a Catholic high school, which the backstory of that's kind of interesting. I'm still researching, but basically this 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 group of kids at this high school wrote to the Who, the band the Who, and said, "Hey, would you guys play our high school to help us raise money?" And the Who did it. So there's a few different bands, and then Sabbath was the last one that did it as well, and they played this high school. Well, there was a guy that I was talking to online that said he was there, and he said that the entire concert, Ozzy had his back to the crowd and didn't face them. And I know that in the beginning, Ozzy was a bit shy about that, and I'm just curious if you guys have ever heard that either, if there was any concerts where Ozzy was the exact opposite of what we know him to be when he plays live. I call bullshit on that. There is no way by Master of Reality. They'd already been touring America by that point. That video we were just talking about was filmed before mm-hmm. Master of Reality. So I, I, I just don't I don't I don't see it. Maybe maybe early, early on when he was at, you know, in Earth or something like that, you know, when they were doing Germany all the time. But I was gonna say even, those first tours of Germany. Yeah, so but, but maybe yeah. Not. I, I don't even buy that. But maybe if it was gonna happen, it would have been there. By that time he was already definitely growing into his stage antics fair enough and people remember stuff weirdly like maybe he only had his back to the crowd for a little bit and then that's how i remembered it but back to ozzy being the 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 main guy or whatever the thing that i learned in my research that i guess i never realized as much is that tony iomi is the backbone i mean yes geezer's great bill's great you know all of them are great but tony iomi's the workhorse he's the one that gets no shit done yeah. when it comes to a record and i've just found a, a just a not that i didn't appreciate him before but i've just found this new appreciation for him after doing the research for the sabotage video yeah. But yeah, especially like with Technical Ecstasy, Tony was in a lot of ways the only one that was willing to put in the work for that album, right? He really labored almost all of it for that album. It's kind of well documented that he was the definite workhorse all the way through the the 70s, but specifically in the later 70s. See, I I think really Tony takes the reins after Roger Bain is no longer involved. Because to me, I think Volume 4 is where really Tony starts to take over the band from a musical direction standpoint. Not that Tony didn't write everything before that, but... With Roger Bain no longer at the helm, I think Tony was the guy to step up at that point. Yeah, that's fair. I am seeing some some indication that it, it was on Masters too, where where they're kind of looking to Tony to coming up with this stuff, and then everybody else kind of filling in. For the most part, they would just look around, wait for Tony to write something before they start jamming with him. I know. Just imagine that pressure. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. This the 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 starting of a good song to have that riff or that idea. To me, a lot of times that's. The most difficult part. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah, definitely totally. a lot of pressure. Like we talked about having a similar background, a similar story. It's kind of odd that you and I got into Black Sabbath while Dio was actually the front man, right? You know, I went more Aussie era as well, even though I, I love the Dio era. But, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, you know, I love all Black Sabbath. Tony Iommi is one of my favorite people on the planet. But, of course, I was drawn to the Aussie era more. What makes you think the fact that, you know, we both got into him in 81, 82, but kind of veered towards the Aussie era. Did you not get into the Dio era as much? No, I, I'm like you. I, I think Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules are, are great albums. No two ways about it. Those are classic Sabbath albums, too. In some way, Ozzy is more of a people's man, right? He's, he's just down to earth. You can tell he's a good dude. Somebody you'd like to hang out with. And I'm not saying Dio's not a good dude. I'm sure he was okay. But he just doesn't seem like to be somebody that you would want to sit down and have a beer with necessarily. Other than he's, a, he's Ryan James Dio, right? right? And again, it's not a stick on him. He's probably more of an intellectual, etc. Ozzy, to me, is just the everyday guy that seems kind-spirited, etc. So maybe that is, for me, the pull to Sabbath is because of that. I agree totally as well, and I think we see ourselves in Ozzy a lot more, right? Yes. Don't, yeah, I, I think that's spot on, Alan. 100%. And, and maybe that's why I like the Sabotage album so much is because... I, you know, younger, I had a lot of rage, not because it was merited. You know, I grew up in a great family, had great support, et cetera. But there's just this underlying angst for some reason going into metal or whatever. And it just seemed like that Sabotage album was filled with it. I th- maybe with the Sabotage, it's, it's hating somebody, taking advantage of somebody else. I fucking hate that. And that's what was going on during that time is Sabbath being taken advantage of for a while. But it was finally coming to full light. And right. just that anger came out, and 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 I respect that. And the way you told that story to start the documentary off really set it up perfectly to tell the rest of the story of the album. I, I thought you did a great job with that. Let me, and and I just want to be clear on this too. So I did write it, but there was other people that were involved with the writing. So I, I can't take full credit for everything written there. 
So one of my buddies, Mark, uh, he helped me out. Another big writer was this guy named Jason. Have you guys ever heard of Steve Hoffman Forum? Yeah, I have. Okay, so on the Steve Hoffman Forum, there's a Black Sabbath album thread where this guy, Jason, I think his name on there is Godshift, and he goes album by album. And he, he does like a write-up about it, and then everybody talks about it. And then like individuals will write reviews, et cetera. Well, I found his write-up about Sabotage, and I thought, man, there's a lot of good shit in here. So I reached out to him. I was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm making this video. Do you mind if I take some of your words and put it in, in, in my script? He's like, yeah, go ahead. So I got his approval, and I put I credit him. I guess I'm just making the point clear that I cannot take the full credit sure. of the writing. There is more than just me involved with it. Are you as big a fan as Ozzy Solo or uh, as Sabbath, or do you lean more, much more towards the Sabbath era? So parts of it, for sure. I love Zach Wild. You know, that dude is just... Just phenomenal, great. Of course, Randy Rhodes' era is excellent. I think Bob Daisley and Lee Kersick got kind of fucked, to be honest with you. I would have liked to hear some more albums with them. Kind of leave it after Zach Wild leaves. Say I listen to more Sabbath than I do Ozzy Solo. Yeah, it's kind of curious. Just curious yeah. where, you, where your taste lay today. I would definitely check out Ordinary Man. I think it's a great record, and especially somebody recording it in their 70s. I'm really, really happy that he was able to produce that, and I'm super excited about his next one as well. You know, it's weird, and I don't know if, if you feel this way. I get Probably not, but as I've gotten older, I don't listen to music as much as I used to. And one of the benefits of doing these videos is it forces me to go back and listen to these records, which is a good thing. Same thing with your podcast. That forces me in a negative way, but it's like, oh, yeah, let me check that out again. So I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to listen to it because for some reason, after the age of about 38, 39, I just don't listen to music as much as I used to. And I don't know where that – I used to own record stores, so I don't know where wow. that – I don't know where that left me because I was a huge, huge, you know, music nerd. So I appreciate that point. I'm not sticking on Ozzy saying I don't like his solo stuff. Yeah, of course. I do like his solo stuff. But if I have to look back and be honest about it, the Sabbath stuff was part of me growing up. Right. And the first couple of Ozzy albums were the same way. So it's imprinted in me in a different way than the later albums. So my question to you guys, and I hope it's okay that I use this opportunity to ask you, is that when, when I listen to your podcast, one of the things that impresses me is that you guys are well-researched, right? Which I think is important because you're trying to provide information to a fan base that is fairly knowledgeable. So to come up with new tidbits of information is impressive. And I'm curious, how do you guys do your research? And, and the reason I'm asking is self-serving because I want to learn from you guys too of how I can better my researching. I'll speak first to this. It's a great question, and we do want to be properly prepared. So a lot of it's a combination of just being a diehard Ozzy fan for me for the last 40 years. So there's a lot of knowledge I've picked up just by reading and researching. And there's just some wonderful books out there. First and foremost, there's some great books by the author Martin Popoff. He's got mm -hmm. an incredible book called Steal Away the Night, The Life of Ozzy Osbourne. That's like a day-to-day -day chronicle of his solo career. And there's a lot of nuggets and tidbits in that. There's some great books by Gary Sharp Young that I research and and go back through that, you know, if I'm if I'm talking about Ultimate Sin, I'll read all the chapters on the Ultimate Sin just to brush up on to make sure that I'm fluent again exactly what was going on during that period. And of course the internet on top of it. Is there any places that you go online specifically? Is there any forums? Because there used to be a Black Sabbath forum, Joe Siegler's website. Yeah, that's that where we all met. <laughs> that's oh, where Josh, really? Yeah, that's where oh, we met. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, for me, the book Dan referenced, Still Away the Night, the Day by Day Chronicle, that is the one we, re we refer to it as the Bible. We do. We use that book for just about everything. It is absolutely excellent. But honestly, for me, I mostly just go back, I re listen to the albums, and I, I view my role on the show as being more color commentary anyway. So it's just more my opinion on things. I kind of leave the facts to Dan in a lot of ways. He's <laughs> got a much quicker recall than I do. I, my memory sucks. Me and Dan and our friend Ryan, who yeah. we mention on the show often, we discuss this stuff so often that really it's kind of prevalent in our brains, isn't it, Dan? Because we discuss it all the time. I'm not exaggerating. Me, Ryan, and Josh probably message each other 20 times an hour just you know, talking about Ozzy. We love Ozzy. I mean, there's just, it's such a big part of our life that they might find a fact and be like, Hey, look what I just found. And boom, it's on our little message group. Yep. And then we'll find a fact there. Or, you know, I'll put, I'll put something like, Holy shit, look what I just found. And that, now it's in the message group. So I think it's just keeping that Ozzy alive. And, and I, and I really mean this doing this by myself would suck balls and I probably wouldn't do it. So hats off to you, Alan, but the love of Josh and our buddy Ryan's 
love with Ozzy is on par with mine. And I'll be honest, there's nowhere else in my life that I have that. My friends really aren't Ozzy friends. I've been playing in bands for 40 years, and I've never really played in a band with a guy that's an obsessed Ozzy fan like I am. So it, if I didn't have Josh and, and, and Ryan, there's just no way I'd be able to do this. Yeah. And Zach, same for me. My last question is, how did you get to meet Ozzy in Noblesville? Was that just like a VIP package? Yes, that was. Okay. Yeah, uh, Pretty much all of my meets I've ever done has been from playing music, and I've opened for a lot of those people. Or That one, I sprung. Yeah, I've done the meet and greet. And all I was promised was front three rows, and then the, obviously the meet and greet. And it ended up being the greatest day of my life because my ticket ended up being front row, dead center stage. Oh, my God. And Congrats, what I had reached out. Adam Wakeman was always really good to respond to me. Mm -hmm. So I let Adam know the night before that I was going to be meet and greet in Noblesville the next day. And he said, cool. He said, uh, let big Dave know that I want to talk to you. He said, and he'll come get me. Oh, so when I got damn. to Ozzy, I told big Dave, because Adam Wakeman wants to say hello to me. I said, he said to tell you, let him know to come get him. He goes, oh, okay. I said, let me get the rest of the meet and greet over with and I'll go grab him for you. Meet and greet finishes. Everyone else goes to their seats. I'm still backstage. Totally unsupervised. Oh my, and my god! My, my wife and I. He goes and gets Adam. Adam comes out, and Adam spoke to me for about thirty minutes. Man, just hung out. The, he's cow. the coolest guy. Yeah, he brought me some pics of his pics of geezers, which geezer doesn't even use a pic. Right. He does have them. He said, "I tried to get you some Tonys, but there were there were none back there." So once he was finished saying hello, he went back, and I was still backstage for Black Sabbath, completely unsupervised. So I just Sad. hung out. The picture was Sharon. She walked by. I just yelled at her and asked her for a photo. She she took the photo. Billy Morrison was back there, all kinds of people. And we were just wandering around like totally unsupervised because of the meet and greet because Adam wanted to say hello to us. So that's how that kind of worked out. But yeah, it ended up being fucking awesome. No, it sounds awesome. I heard, I heard that conversation with Adam. That was, yeah, that was very cool. I got, yeah. I got to hear them sound check. They played age of reason that sound check. Got to watch them sound check. Yeah. That's awesome. It, it was, it was kind of neat. Yeah. It, it was cool. Hey. I've seen Sabbath up there twice and I've seen Ozzy up there once solo. What is your thoughts on 13 Allen? I love it. Yeah, me too. Awesome. We do me too, too, of course. Yeah. yeah. I think it's I, I, and I was worried too, right? I was like, oh shit, man. Please be good. Please be good. And uh it was good. So yeah, no, I was very happy with everything about it. So no, I, I was I was thrilled about that album. Do you have yeah. the eight uh, additional tracks as well? I do. Yeah. yeah, they're great. Now to be fair, I'm not a fan of the the seven star type stuff. I know there's a lot of diehards that love the Tony Martin airs. I don't get it personally. I mean, it's all good that they like it, but that's probably the era that I, I stay away from. Yeah, I, I'd say I, I'm actually a huge fan of Born Again. Me and, me oh, and Born Again's awesome. I mean, yeah, I fucking love Born Again. To me, that's the closest they ever came to sounding like an Aussie original record ever again was Born Again. Dude, but, Born uh, Again is the shit. And, and I, I know that it's not mixed well, but I heard something that maybe Tony has got the Masters and he's going to He gonna does. It. Yep, it's true. He finally found him after all those years, which is great. So glad you liked Born Again, because it's definitely one of my favorites as well. And it, was, it was another weird album that for the longest time I couldn't, it, like when CDs were first coming out, you couldn't get that other than as an import, which was just weird. It was always tough to get that album, like in the late 80s, early 90s, which I, I never got. There's a story behind that, too, and I don't know what it was or is. But yeah, I agree with you, man. Uh, from the front to the end, that's a great album. Yeah, I actually have my original vinyl still. I do have it on CD, and then I have the deluxe edition. Mm. So I'm pretty fortunate. I got three versions. They also have an unreleased song called The Fallen that's on that. Have you heard that one yet? Mm, I don't know. I yeah, don't think so. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, yeah, it's really cool. I don't know why I, it was left off the record. I do supposedly have the the original mix of the album, but I don't know if that's actually what it is. It's not. It's a board mix, I think, before it went into final mix. I have that okay. as well. And I have a couple of bootlegs from that tour. And me and Josh differ on this, but the only person I could stand singing Ozzy original stuff was Ian Gillen. He actually does a pretty cool version of Black Sabbath. I'm not a fan of Dio doing the Ozzy, no. Ozzy era, but obviously I'm not saying he's better than Ozzy or nothing crazy like that, but he does a serviceable job on the Ozzy era stuff. That's a that's a funny point you bring up because Ozzy's the most untechnical singer out of the three, Dio, Gillen, and him. Yep. But none of those dudes can really pull off his songs as well. Agreed. The, the live evil album to me is just like, oh, when they do the Sabbath songs, like, ugh. It's, yeah. Well, we make the argument all the time that I feel Speak of the Devil is what made those songs classic Sabbath songs. If you really look at the track listing on Speak of the Devil, all of those are the classic Black Sabbath songs that we know and love today. And I think that's mainly because of Speak of the Devil. I, I have to agree with you, man. When I was younger, there was definitely, I mean, I had listened to Sabbath. I loved Sabbath. But when I heard the Speak of the Devil album, it really did mean, damn, dude, these songs are the shit. 
yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's cemented it in for me. So I, I, I agree with you. But I am learning that not all that was recorded live either, though. No, no. Right. Uh, musically it was. Right, but, but it wasn't like yeah. that was just a one concert and then they... You know, Ozzy's vocals weren't overdub, etc. No, no, it was right. it was three concerts. They did uh, they right, did a sound check and then two nights and then. But didn't Ozzy do some overdubs on? In... Oh, of course, okay. absolutely. But well, I'm okay with that. To be honest, as a fan, I was okay with it because it sounded great. It does. Exactly. I think Ozzy sounds amazing on that. Yeah. I always thought tribute was overdubbed too, but we just found out recently that it is not. It's actually a culmination of the Montreal show and the Cleveland show. And I only figured this out by listening to the bootlegs and then listening to Tribute, which was a painstakingly process. But Max probably, I don't even know if Max realized he did this because he thought it was the same show maybe, but he kind of cut the vocals from both shows and made it into a single vocal track. Mm, interesting. But if you listen to those boots that we all have, I was it was I think Flying High Again where I, te I texted Josh and said, holy shit, that's exactly the same line from the, the Montreal show. And lo and behold, you know, you could tell that he's snipping vocals from both shows. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You can go on for days. There's all kinds yeah. of stories. Yeah. One more thing, Alan, that I, I think fans probably really appreciate about the show was the colorized photos. That was a really a great idea to take classic photos that we've all seen a million times before, but colorize them so that we see them in a different light. I thought that was a really great idea. So good job on that. Hey, man, I appreciate that. And, and that brings up a, a good point of, I don't know that anybody will care, but one of the reasons that I do these videos is because that's my day job is as a video editor, but it's for a big corporation and I don't necessarily have all the creative freedom. So by doing these videos, I'm able to keep that editing blade sharp, if that makes sense. And one of the things that, that I wanted to learn new was how to colorize photos. So I thought it was just a great opportunity to not only learn how to do that, but then also show some of the breathe, you know, Know, new life into some of these pictures so i appreciate you pointing that out and i'm glad that people enjoy it because there's definitely going to be those again on the next video yeah absolutely that's that's amazing so how i don't really know a whole lot about either how that works how accurate is that is that a 100 proven accuracy with those color not at photos, all. or is it no okay you're, you're really just guessing there's there's no way for you to absolutely know what shade of blue those jeans were you see somebody yeah. wearing what looks like jeans you're like well those are jeans i'll make those blue right Maybe they're not blue, right? So you're just, all you're doing is speculating that this is how it looks. Or if you have another photo where they're wearing the same outfit, then you can take that. But for the most part, it's just guessing. All right, Alan, man, we appreciate you coming on the show. Again, congratulations on the success of the documentary. It's absolutely excellent. Like Sabbath, Sabotage, the documentary. If you haven't watched it yet, listeners, please go out and give it, you know, give it its view because it's absolutely amazing. You'll totally enjoy it. But until next time, guys, we will see you on the other side. Hey, guys, thank you so much for having me on. It's really been an honor to come on your podcast. I, I, I just found out about your podcast, but I really love it. I'm about four episodes in, and, and I'm slowly making it through all the episodes, and, and I continue to look forward to the next one. So thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much, Alan. Speak with you soon. while i was in diapers <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. all right we get it like, younger uh, than us yeah. yeah to me it's just so much more street level